And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is a Seinfeld episode called The Pitch, where George Costanza and Jerry are pitching what is basically Seinfeld to an NBC executive in the show. And George, in helping the executive to kind of understand his pitch, famously says, it's a show about nothing. And the executive says, what do you mean? And, you know, they have the banter where George says, well, what'd you do today? Well, I got up and I went to work. Well, that's the show. There it is. Whatever you did, write it down. That's the show. Mark 1 sometimes feels a bit like that to me. Mark is simply taking us through Jesus' life. He went here, write it down. He said this, write it down. He met this person, write it down. And there's something compelling, Seinfeld picked up on this, and the gospel writers absolutely have, about following around interesting people. And as we follow Jesus in his day-to-day activities, we start to understand some of his mission, even in the smallest details. There is no specific message in our gospel reading today. It's rather a group of healing stories, a demonstration over Christ's power, over sickness, over demons, over all spiritual forces of evil. We follow him as he moves around Capernaum and the surrounding region, healing people and preaching the gospel. And when talking about demons, Mark does something really interesting. He time and time again stresses their knowledge about the identity of Jesus Christ. In our reading today, we see that Jesus says he did not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. A couple verses earlier, an unclean spirit is cast out of a person, and it gestures or points to Jesus and says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The first character in the Gospel of Mark, besides the Father himself, to identify Jesus as God is not a scribe or a Pharisee or a priest or a prophet. It's a demon. And so it's absolutely wrong for us to equate the demons, those who rebel against God, with a form of atheism. It could not be further from the truth. The enemies of the cross in the Gospel of Mark are not those who deny it exists, but those who do not, do not submit to Jesus as Lord, choosing instead to elevate themselves as masters of their own life. Jesus' rebuke of the demons is not because they are wrong. They correctly identify exactly who he is. They are rebuked because they have the head knowledge, but nothing else. They know who it is who is standing before them, but they refuse to fall down on their knees and worship him. I'm sure you've heard this before. James' famous passage about faith without work says that even the demons believe and shudder, but if you do not have works with your faith, your faith is dead. But I want to investigate briefly what this actually means for our life. What does it mean for us to have the head knowledge without the knowledge of the heart? And importantly, how can we move from one to the other? How can we align our hearts with what we confess with our lips? I think we have to fight the temptation every single day, if you're like me, that says our head knowledge is good enough. You sit at the pews or stand at the altar. You say the right words, but your heart isn't in it. We have to fight the temptation that says, I confess Jesus is Lord. I know he's God. I know he's the creator, and that's good enough. I don't need to pray I don't need to investigate my own heart. I definitely don't need to fall down and submit my entire life to his. Here's a good example. Chloe and I's uh, anniversary will be coming up in a few months. And if May comes and passes, and there's no flowers, there's no note, there's no acknowledgement, something is going to be wrong. Because our marriage is not built on the fact that both of us simply know that we are husband and wife. It's built on self-sacrifice. It's built on acts of love. There's something deeper than the head knowledge there. And this should not discourage us. This is not uh, Jesus reprimanding us that you're not good enough. Rather, it should encourage us. There's no quiz for being a faithful Christian. Your doctrine doesn't have to be the most articulated in the entire room for you to witness, to bear witness to your Lord and Savior. 
There's no intellectual bar you have to achieve to be able to talk about your faith. Doctrine is helpful, but only when it leads to worship. So what do we do with this information? How do we move from knowledge of the head to knowledge of the heart? Returning to Mark's gospel, there is one thing the demons do not do. Yes, they call Jesus Lord, they call him the Most High, but immediately after Jesus cast them out, we see him demonstrate this difference. There is a verse that serves as a, a break in the action and a transition to the next scene. And in the morning, a great while before the day, he rose and went out to a lonely place, and there he prayed. Jesus has spent his day doing good and holy things, things that we could only dream of doing, casting out demons, healing the sick, preaching the gospel, but this is not a substitute for prayer. He doesn't say, I've done enough good things, I don't need to pray. He gets up while it's still dark, before anyone else has awoken, and he communes with the Father. He bears his heart in that intimate conversation that is prayer. No doubt he was tired, he had a busy day yesterday, but nothing can take the place of prayer. And this is what separates the demons from the true believers, those who know the facts from those who know with their heart. Prayer is a conversation with God, and those who desire an intimate relationship with Him cannot help but jump at the opportunity to converse with Him, to converse with Him from the very depths of their being. Jesus' soul longed for communion. And we may spend our days doing good and holy things. We may feed the hungry. We may house the homeless, as we did last night in Drake Hall. But this does not take the place of prayer. Rather, it flows from it. Prayer becomes the very foundation of our being, the very foundation of our communion with God. Simon Peter and the others go and find Jesus as he is praying, thinking that he's missing out on more that he could be doing. Everyone is looking for you, they say. Come and do those wonderful things again. But Jesus is right where he needs to be. He is communing with the Father, which is the foundation of all of those other things that he can do. I recently picked up a new hobby recently, um, shooting analog film, 35 millimeter. So I have a couple of cameras on my shelf made before I was born. Um, and I, you know, looked up how to load the, the old negative film, and when James goes to bed at night, I'll develop it in my kitchen sink and hang it from my bathroom. And it's been, it's been a fun little analog experience, kind of reaching back to, to a different way of shooting film. But I grew up with uh, phones as cameras. I just simply had to pull it out of my pocket and point and shoot. And so I had to teach myself about exposure, about aperture and shutter speed and all these little manual controls on all these old cameras that I'm sure many of you know much better than I do. But there's a good comparison I heard one day between this type of analog photography and prayer that has been on my mind ever since I picked up this hobby. Prayer is uh, exposure for our souls. If you've ever used one of these older cameras, you know that however long you open the shutter or however wide the lens is, how much light gets in determines how bright your picture is. If it's open for a millisecond, not much light will get in, and your negative won't actually be a good representation of reality. But the longer it's open, the more of that light comes in, the more that that negative film actually reflects reality. When we pray, we are opening our hearts. It's like that shutter opening, and our souls are exposed to the light of God. And if we only do this once in our life for a fraction of a second, we will not reflect the light of Christ very well. But the more we pray, the more we expose our soul to the light of God, the more we begin to reflect His glory, His love, His mercy, and His grace. The demons do not want to be exposed to this light which is why they do not pray. They prefer the cover of darkness where they conceal the image of their creator. But we as believers want to reflect his image and so we bear our soul. We expose our soul in front of that marvelous light so that we may be more like him. Friends, Ash Wednesday is uh, 10 days away. 
Lent has snuck up on me. I'm sure it has on you as well. And soon you will hear the church start making demands of us. She will ask us, most of all, to pray. To pray intensely over these next 40 days. And you may know all the arguments for God. You may have every word of the Mass memorized. You may know the sanctoral calendar from Advent 1 to Christ the King Sunday. You may have the books of the Bible memorized in order. You may know all of it. But if you don't pray, you've missed it. You've missed what Jesus Christ has come here to proclaim. You've missed that opportunity to actually know Christ and be known by him. What separates us from the demons? Not our intellectual fortitude, not our doctrine, not our ability to speak eloquently. What separates us from them is our prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.